Hello, Lauren, Nicole Yates, Heather, Elizabeth, Chloe, Nancy, Brandy, Tony, Mary, Nicole Hutchko, Moish, Jillian, Mildred, Liz, Gina, and Atasha. Thank you for another excellent week of discussion in week two. I really appreciate all of your participation, your engagement, your insights. A lot of great stuff. I am going to make a valiant attempt this week to make this a little bit shorter than last week. Like 11 minutes and 27 seconds was a little bit long, so I'll try to do better. Discussion forum one, women as ethical leaders. So we had a variety of opinions. Uh, Elizabeth said that she believed that women were more ethical as leaders. Heather disagreed. And they had a little bit of a conversation about that. Uh, Elizabeth said perhaps it might be more accurate for her to say that in her experience in the financial sector that women act more ethically than men. And Heather responded with the idea that perhaps it would make sense for some of this research to be conducted in, uh, in more specific ways so that we might look at leaders in finance or leaders in the hospitality industry or leaders in other sectors and industries to see if there were differences between men and women in in those roles in those uh, specific industries and that that might that might be more profitable. Um, it's also pointed out that Mildred and Heather looked at the same data, some of the same research and came up with opposite conclusions. One that women were more ethical leaders, more ethical as leaders, and the other that uh, there was no difference between men and women as ethical leaders. I think one of the things that this points out is that we all come to the table, we all come to our research with biases, and a lot of you pointed that out. And we all have confirmation bias. So we look at research and the way that we read the research tends to reinforce what we already believe. One of the benefits of engaging in discussion with other people is that sometimes, if we allow it to, that can break through our confirmation bias. So we can end up with a discussion like the one that Heather and Elizabeth had, where they can, there can be some movement from no women are more ethical as leaders. Yes, women are, or are, are not more ethical as leaders. We can move from uh, two completely different opinions to a more nuanced, uh, a more nuanced analysis of the situation. And in general, I think that's true. I think it, it when we interact with people who have different opinions than we do, it helps us to see other parts of reality and help us helps us to have a better analysis and to be, make better decisions both ethically and operationally. So I, I think that's one of the that, that's one of the, the big pluses of having different people with different backgrounds come to a come to a discussion. Uh, one of the things that came up that I thought was an interesting question was Nancy asked Brandy why do you think that women are better leaders and men better managers? And I thought I thought about this question, and my first gut reaction was, especially with, with uh, the ethical aspect of it, is that in general, again, not absolutely every single case, but in general, women tend to be able to think a little bit more outside the box than men, and men tend to be more procedure followers, uh, rule followers, and not to um, not to think how to go, how to color outside the lines, so to speak. And so those traits would make women better leaders, because those are the people that have to come up with things that are that are new and innovative and outside the box. And men better managers, who are responsible mainly for making sure that things get done correctly according to policies and procedures. There's a Harvard Business Review article from earlier this year that uh, that kind of supports that gut reaction on my report, on my part. Uh, some interesting information. Again, this is not an absolute, every single woman is a better leader than every single man. That's not what I'm claiming and that's not what the Harvard Business Review article is claiming. It's just pointing out that there are some 
perceived differences between men and women in their in their leadership and that it might be worth paying attention to. Uh, Atasha uh, also mentioned and uh, that women tend to be more compassionate than men. Mary and Nancy agreed with that. Probably most of that, us would agree with that. But some of you also asked the question, is that necessarily always the best trait as an ethical leader? Is compassion always the best uh, ethical value for a leader to have in all situations? Or is it possible that there are some situations where strictly following a rule or strictly following a policy would be the, the more ethical option, even if it might seem to not be the most compassionate option for a particular person or a particular employee? And, and, that, I think is a, and that I think is a great question. I also think that that's why, as I tried to, um, as I tried to argue in the discussion forums, uh, that diversity on leadership teams is a real help, not just in terms of making decisions for, for operations and process, but also in making ethical decisions. And if it is true, if it's even a little bit true that women and men tend to look at ethical decisions a bit differently, then it makes sense to, to make sure that there are both men and women included in the, in the decision-making process to get a broader picture, to get a more complete view of the truth. And I would say also that it makes sense to have people from different cultures, different philosophical backgrounds, different um, socioeconomic backgrounds, because all of those things will affect the way that we view the world and hence the way we view ethical decisions. In uh, discussion two, ethical priorities, we had some great conversation about how to prioritize uh, stakeholders, which stakeholders should receive the priority when making an ethical decision. And I guess the thing that, that I would lift up here is that one, you can make the case that certain stakeholders should always or almost always get priority. You can make the case, for example, that under U.S. law, shareholders have the priority, that the duty of CEOs, managers, the people running the company, the duty, their duty is to maximize profits, that that's, that's what's supposed to happen in a publicly held stock-backed company. That's the way it's set up. You could argue that. But I think it's difficult to say that that that's that shareholders should always have the priority, that there aren't situations in which shareholders making a little bit less money might be justified because it enormously benefits employees, for example, or because it continues a long-standing, reliable supplier relationship, which may continue to benefit the company in the long run, even if it reduces shareholder profits in the short run. So I think, I think when we look at these questions of which stakeholders have, have priority, it's helpful to use models. It's helpful to use models like the one I posted in the discussion forum from our reading about stakeholders, high, whether they're high power or low power or high interest or low interest, to think about the interest and power that stakeholders have and to say that's, that affects how much consideration that they have. That a stakeholder that has a high interest in a decision and a lot of power to influence the decision should have more attention than someone who has low interest and, and low power because they care more and they have more ability to influence it. I think that's that may not necessarily be an ethical thing, but it is kind of, I think it's a kind of a common sense thing. And Gina pointed out that there's another, there's another framework that's very similar that doesn't list stakeholders, but just talks about people and high interest and low interest and high power and low power and using that framework to help decide which people get the priority when a decision is being made. And I think that's a great tool, tool, great tool as well. They're very similar, but use the tool that makes the most sense to you. Use the one that, that, uh, that fits best with you. I think either one of those would be a great tool to use. Another great tool that Gina also pointed out is the PLUS model. 
I think that this is uh, this is a great tool for making helping us to make ethical decisions because it helps us think through things. We just don't go with our first impression. We don't just go with our gut, but we go with a process. So we think of the policies and procedures. Is the decision in line with those policies and procedures at our company? Is it legal? Good question. Is it legal? Go with legal. Almost always go with legal. Is it universal? How does this relate to the values and principles that our company has? And self, does it meet my standards of justice and fairness? Is this something that I would feel good about doing, that I would feel I was making an ethical decision that was true to myself and my own values? And I guess the last thing, the last criterion that I would put in there too is what we used to call the New York Times test. Would you feel good about this showing up on the front page of the New York Times? Or these days we might say, would you feel good about this showing up on all your friends' Facebook feeds, your Twitter feed, and Instagram? If you would feel good about this being completely public, I think that's a good question for us to ask ourselves, because usually if something doesn't quite feel right ethically, we won't want it to be completely public. And if we do feel that it could be completely public, we can feel fairly confident that it meshes with our values. So I'm sorry, it looks like it's going to be 11 minutes and 20 some seconds again. Sorry about that. But I hope this is helpful. And if there's any other way that I could be helpful, or if you would like to continue conversation, please reach out to me. Thanks a lot.